So, Egypt. All right. Let's see. Here's your blah, blah, blah. Some terms. And aliens. <laughs> um, aliens did not build the pyramids, just so you know. Um, could somebody grab the, the door in the back? Some people are walking around up there. All right. Egyptian history is, <clears throat> is very long. Right? It is very old civilization, and it has a remarkable amount of continuity for a remarkable amount of time. So to break that up a little bit, to help out a little bit, um, I laid out what, you know, a little periodization table here, breaking up different periods. We're not going to talk about all of these in the same amount of detail, of course. You know, many of them I'm not going to talk about at all. And um, it ends, you can see here, in the Greek period, the Ptolemaic period. Uh, after that point, Egypt is uh, never independent, really, again, with a distinct, uh, actually, Egyptian civilization. It falls under the control of one empire after another. Uh, you know, the, the Romans, the Arabs, etc. cetera. Right? Um, there are periods of foreign conquest before that point, but Egyptian civilization was still strong enough to, to uh, reassert its own kind of like independent character. Even in that period, the last three centuries, it's actually ruled by a Greek ruling class who spoke Greek. Uh, I think you mentioned Cleopatra earlier? Yes. Um, she was near the very end of that time period, near the very end of that 300 years, and she is the only one of the Ptolemaic rulers we know of who even bothered to learn the Egyptian language. They haven't bothered to learn the Kemetic language. Um, everyone else, they just spoke Greek. So it was a Greek ruling class, but the common culture was still Egyptian. Right, yeah, you know, all, the, all those old traditions were still around. Right? After that period, they go into terminal decline and eventually cease to exist. The people today living in Egypt are descendants of pyramid builders, but their culture is not. Right? Their, their culture has been slowly replaced by wave after wave of other peoples. So I noticed, how was the timeline established? Do you know, like, did someone just say, uh, it is off topic question, but I've always wondered about that. You know. the, the the calendar system that we, that we inherit is the Roman one, okay. right? That we, we, we actually still use a direct descendant of the Roman calendar, um, and with minor tweaks made by the, the by the Christian Church, um, the the year the dating for the years comes out of Christianity, comes out of the Christian Church. The basic structure of the calendar is Roman. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, and of course, to, I mentioned in the first class to kind of like take the, the religious aspect out of that, you know, so it doesn't say, um, you know, before Christ, it says before the common era. Yeah. Right. Um, but the, the basic structure is, is still like the Roman slash Christian calendar. So they just said, we're going to start at 3,000 and work our way down until we hit zero? Uh, no, no one, no one did this at all. The, they, mm -hmm. These guys did not use this calendar. Uh, the Egyptian calendar is completely different from the Roman calendar. Everyone else in antiquity used their own calendar systems. We, uh, in hindsight, are using this, this dating system. So I'm using a dating system that you would recognize. So that you can tell, looking at this, that that top number up, up there um, is uh, 5,118 years ago. It's oh, 3,100 okay. plus right. 2018. Yeah. So you, can, you, you know exactly when that is. Okay. Right? Um, if I said in the third year of the cow, right, um, no. <laughs> or in the 15th year of the reign of Aminhotep, would that mean anything to you? No. Probably not, right? Okay. So we're stuck using, you know, a common dating system. Oh. Now, the, the differentiation here in different periods, that also is a later innovation. The Egyptians would not have recognized this at all. If you had told Egyptians, oh yeah, this is the Middle Kingdom, they would, what the hell are you talking about? It would make no sense at all. Um, we divide different periods based upon significant changes um, in Egyptian history. Right, so we break different groups of dynasties into different time periods here. Um, the first point to make, and um, this is always a lot easier to do because I went a little back and forth uh, a number of times when we talked about the Mesopotamians, right? Um, so that was a, that's why that's always a little bit longer. Um, you guys already know that this is a much easier place to live, right? So let's talk about why. Um, first off, this is a modern map of Egypt. You know, using the, the modern borders. This would not have been recognizable to ancient Egyptians either. Right? They would not have had these political borders. Um, because there is nothing really here, and there was nothing here in the ancient world either. So no one bothered to claim it. Right? Egypt was the area in the Nile Valley, and then a few areas that they controlled around it, like the, the, the hills here for mining, um, the parts of the Sinai for mining lapis lazuli and things. They, they, they you know, occasionally try to control some areas nearby. But, but ancient Egypt was primarily the Nile River Valley. That's it. 
And the Egyptians themselves never established colonies, and then they tried not to move out of their own territory. An Egyptian did not want to die away from his homeland. Right? So the Nile River Valley is the key. It's the only real issue here. But the reason I use this map here to, to start is to just show you what the physical geography looks like. This is mostly desert. Right? The only part of this land that's fertile is the Nile River Valley. Uh, and nearly the entirety of the population, both in antiquity and in the present day, lives there right? uh, in that narrow strip of land. But that land is so astonishingly fertile that if not for setting aside uh, land for um, uh, cattle, because you know, cattle take up more space and consume grain that peoples could eat, and if not for the production of cash crops like cotton for t-shirts and stuff, Egypt would still be self-sufficient in agriculture. It could still feed its 80 million people today. That land is astonishingly productive. Right? Uh, it is also geographically isolated. Um, Think about what's over here. No one's going to invade from this direction because it's a desert. No one's going to invade from down here because it's a desert, right? As well as the, the river in this area is not navigable, right? Uh, there's all kinds of breaks and waterfalls and whatnot here. You can only really sail on it along this stretch here. Um, they're not going to invade from over here because that's also a desert, right? And this is the Red Sea over here, and that's the Mediterranean. Do you see what we're looking at here? It is extremely well protected, which means that Egypt is also isolated. It is close enough to other uh, you know, cultures in the ancient Near East that it can trade with them and interact with them. And it does. Right? There's an extensive amount of interconnection there. In fact, the, if you trace it back all the way to its beginning, the most ancient roots of our writing system actually do go back to Egyptian. Right? Um, we can't get into the, all the, the, the details there, but it, the um, the Sinaitic writing system evolved out of Egyptian, and the Canaanite Phoenician writing system evolved out of Sinaitic, and you know, the, the, the Lytic Greek and Latin evolved out of Phoenician. It's a long process right, of change there, but there's a, always been connection, is my point. Egyptians have always been involved in their neighborhood, but they have not moved out and settled in those areas, and other peoples didn't often come in and settle into that area. It's just through trade. Cool there? And so, and so they're relatively well protected. And for most of its history, it won't even bother leaving to try and even fight other people. It won't, it won't try to like, fight other empires. It won't be a conquering state. It'll basically like, stick around in its, own, in, in its own isolated area. But the Nile itself is extremely um, productive for them, very, very fertile. Um, the, um, the basic Egyptian calendar had three, three periods, the three, three seasons right, you know, uh, in the year there. Um, we don't need to get into the details there, but um, one of them, just so you know, it was, was called inundation, and that was when the river flooded. And what it does is it's brought tons and tons of soils and silts from farther down in East Africa, and it's brought them up, and it overflows its banks, and then after a couple months, the waters have slowly receded and gone back to the normal size of the Nile, and it's left behind all those rich nutrients. It's replenished the soil. It's replenished the nitrogen in the soil. And after that, you've got your planting season. You throw the food out there and let it grow. And then you've got another season a period after that. You can basically get two whole growing seasons out of it. So you can produce a massive amount of food, right? Because it is uh, a desert climate and constant sunlight there. Uh, you, you, you can grow any, any, any time of the year. One of the reasons that California, for example, feeds much of the country, even though we don't have much water, right? Um, the sunshine here means you've got good growing seasons. Cool there? So um, an agricultural surplus means that Egypt will develop politically much faster than Mesopotamia did. Uh, the, uh, the fact that you have so much extra food means that Egypt was actually the first country in the world to have a standing army, to have a full-time army, because it had so much extra food that it could set aside a huge amount of people that didn't have to produce food, didn't have to be involved in it at all, and could just you know, practice fighting all the time instead. Right? It could afford to waste that money right? you know, and waste that food on people. Uh, and it manages to unify politically much faster, too, in, you know, in, in part because life is good. Life is relatively easy. There are a few other foreign conquerors to mess with. Um, you, they can bring together a smaller, a smaller strip of territory. Initially, there's two separate territories. I'm not going to walk you through a lot of the prehistory of Egypt in this class here. There's a, uh, I give you samples of that for, in Mesopotamia, uh, largely because it's the first place that happened. That's the only reason I even went into any of the, the earliest periods there. Um, Egypt started 
uh, similarly long ago and went through long, long stages, eventually built up two separate kingdoms in the north and south, and then they finally unified about uh, 5,000 years ago. Right? We're not going to go through any of the earlier parts there. But it does come together here uh, around 3100 uh, BCE as a single unitary state, and the pharaohs became the kings of Upper and Lower Egypt, Upper being to the south and Lower being to the north, because the Nile flows uh, from south to north. Right. So, um, bring the territory together. And that gives us our sense of kingship. What does it mean to be a ruler? What was the key concept in kingship I gave you from Mesopotamians to know? I'll give you a, a key idea here that, that's going to be on the, the quiz there for um, what kings were like, what rulership was like in Mesopotamia. As far as Sargon? Uh, yeah, the how, innovation. How, how it was the, heroic, uh, heroic. Yeah, heroic kingship, right? Uh, heroic kingship builds on what we had before. The kings are priests. They're priest kings. They talk to the gods, but they also have to be conquerors. Right? And that's how we understood the rulers. The rulers were a person who talked to the gods and fought people. Right? That's our understanding there. And the rulers in Mesopotamia had to depend upon legal systems and a law system to connect a larger territory, to connect together all these different cities, right? because they were scattered over a very wide area. Transport was much more difficult and to get from place to place. Um, it was, you know, so uh, you needed to establish a system that could work in the different cities. In Egypt, transport is relatively easy in the settled areas, because the Nile in the area that it was built up was navigable. You could sail up and down in it. And everything was built along the same bank of the Nile. All the cities were built along the Nile, right off the river, right, all on the same side. So transport was really super easy between cities, so you didn't have to worry about communication issues. Uh, so they didn't bother with a formal legal system. And instead of having a ruler that talks to the gods, that is an intercessor with the gods, the ruler in Egypt is a god. He is literally a god descendant, and at his coronation becomes a living god and at his death will continue to be worshipped as a god, right, and prayed to. So it's a very different understanding here of the role of the ruler, as well as a different understanding of law. Pharaohs did not want a formal written legal system here, because the next pharaoh might want a different law. He might want to do things a little bit differently here. So they had traditions. They often had certain ideas that would only be done the same way. Egyptians are an extremely conservative people. They tended not to change a great deal, but they didn't bother to write it down because they didn't want to take away the prerogative of the living God. Right? There was no real need to do it. Um, so um, that gives you a sense here of their power. And I want to talk you through in, in looking at the old kingdom period, at the oldest period in Egyptian history, uh, just how powerful these pharaohs were. Because they are considerably different uh, uh, in the earlier periods. Egypt would always maintain this idea of a pharaoh. All the way up until the Roman period, when Egypt finally loses its independence permanently, the rulers are con continue to be living gods. Right? But the, uh, the amount of power that they have over people and society will change. Right? It'll be tempered a bit over time. They are much more powerful in the earliest periods of Egyptian history than they are later. Right. And we'll talk a little about uh, why that happens. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. First good example I can give you um, about the development of power in Egypt. Uh, and this, again, uh, we could spend a lot more time talking about the slow development of this as, um, a, as a technique, as an architectural innovation here, but pyramids. You guys have all heard of pyramids. Mm, pyramids. Um, so where are they going to show up in the first place? Pyramids are built of stone, right? That's one uh, key step forward for them. And they evolve out of uh, a, a design called the mastaba, basically like a, a, a big rectangular building that you kind of like built up and you, you, you put the, the, the dead king inside the mastaba. Um, but somebody wanted something a little bit different and uh, this architect said, I got a cool idea. How about like we kind of like build up a little taller, right? Um, and we'll build up in stone instead of mud brick and we'll build like a tall building. It's like, cool, try it. And it didn't work. Right? They went through quite a few experiments to try and get to this, uh, the techniques for this. The first actually successful uh, technique is, for building pyramids gives us what's called uh, the Step Pyramid of Djoser. Right? Um, and this one here, um, if you take the sand off of it, you can see it's just basically, it's like um, a layered cake, you know, like a wedding cake, like you know, smaller layers as you go up, right? kind of stacked on top of each other. It isn't smoothed out. 
has a nice single shape there, but it does go up in that same way. Right? And they kind of figured this out where they just built a big stone platform, then put another stone platform on top of that, another stone platform on top of that, but managed to build it such that um, it could actually uh, support the weight of an open room below, right? uh, that it wasn't all going to collapse on top of that, and you could bury the king under there. That was the cool idea with it. Right? So it's an important step forward architecturally. The reason for the pyramid as, um, as an idea of something built in stone really is that sense of permanence. And that gets at something that is, I think, characteristic of Egyptian civilization overall. Uh, where we talked about it in Mesopotamia, them valuing um, innovation, it was a much more dynamic place because it had to be to, to, to thrive. Because life is so easy in Egypt, they value stability. And stone does not change much. So they generally built in stone. It was much more permanent. Some of that, of course, also is environmental. Um, uh, there are, for example, no trees in Egypt. Right? It is a desert, so you get palms. But palms are, you know palm trees are not actually trees? Just so you know. Palm trees aren't trees. Joshua trees aren't trees. We just call them trees. But they're plants. Right? Um, it's basically just a tall shrub. Right? Um, they don't have actual trees, so you don't get the, like, the, the trunks there. To, to bring in like, wood for you know, architectural projects, they actually had to import it from places like Lebanon. Right? Um, so partly there, there are environmental reasons. There's tons of stone available uh, on either side of the Nile, all along the, uh, uh, the east side. You've got all those hills to mine. You can take stone out of there. But the bigger reason here really is that once you build it, it stays, and it doesn't change. Right? It, it doesn't, doesn't weather very much. which really plays in well to the overall conservative values of Egypt. There were a number of pyramids after the Step Pyramid to try and get to um, the, the, the basic, the, the smoother shape. Some of the earlier ones, they, uh, they collapsed completely and didn't work out, or they had to change the angle partway through to avoid them collapsing, so they look really weird, and there's one that's like kind of bent at a kind of weird angle. Um, but they're, they're trying to figure out how to do this, and they finally, they master it. They get the technique. They've got it. Uh, the, the red pyramid is the first pyramid that's actually a perfectly smooth shape, right? Um, and from that, um, the, the ruler Khufu decides to just go balls out and build the biggest freaking pyramid ever. Right? They've got the basic technique, and he says, okay, make me a super big one. And they do. Right, so I want to give you an example here um, of uh, what's called the Great Pyramid, or, or Khufu's Pyramid, or if you want to use the Greek form of his name, Cheops Pyramid. Um, it is uh, the largest man-made structure on Earth for more than 4,000 years. That's a record that will never be beaten. Right? Um, there were buildings that end up being larger on the ground, but nothing that tall for a very long time. Uh, this is it here. Um, <clears throat> you can see kind of like stacked up there. There's a building in front that actually has what's left of like a funerary barge, like the, the boat that was used when he was like, you know, being buried, you know, kind of taken down the Nile and they, they buried it next to it. We found it and it was preserved. And that's kind of cool. But the pyramid is here. Um, the sides of it you can see are pretty rough, right? That was not originally the case. All of the pyramids were covered in what are called casing stones. They were perfectly smooth all the way down. Right? Stories from antiquity um, are kind of like, I mean, obviously this is just a fanciful sort of statement, but there's like, ah, if you went up to the top and dropped a grain of sand, it would bounce all the way down and never go into a crack. Because like, you could, they couldn't see any cracks. They couldn't see the seams. It was just put together perfectly, nice and smooth all the way down. Uh, most of those casing stones are taken off over many years, much, much later. Right, so long, long past the, the collapse of Egyptian civilization. In fact, those ca the casing stones of most pyramids survived all the way up until our Middle Ages, about a thousand years ago. And then they were stripped off to be used for building material. Right? So they don't really look the way they would have looked in antiquity. It's similarly large, it's tall, but it doesn't have the same shape that it would have, or the same colors. And the Khufu's uh, Pyramid is the largest? It is the largest, yeah. So is it also known as the Pyramid of Giza? Or? It's on the Giza Plateau, so it's the largest of the Giza Pyramids. There are several pyramids okay. in Giza. All right. All right. Um, I'm going to show you one of the other, one, one of the other ones there, um, and there's a handful of smaller ones. Um, okay. There's actually uh, a number of different places in Egypt where pyramids are built. Um, the, the largest concentration is, is at Giza. Okay, okay. Uh, and then it's, uh, there's much at Saqqara. Now, the, the, the ruler who reigned immediately after um, Khufu, we, people used to think, um, had 
uh, kind of come to power, um, sort of, you know, through dirty means. Maybe he killed somebody. There are some kind of controversies here because they couldn't find any real records of him, and they couldn't find a pyramid. They, they wondered, well, where, where's this guy buried? I mean, if he clearly wasn't important enough. He, he disappeared. Well, it turned out he actually was, and that's what's left of his pyramid. But he built his pyramid at a different location, at right, a different site, and it had fallen to ruins and been taken apart for building materials, you know, uh, so it had disappeared. So it took a long time for us to identify what it was. But in the process of that, we found a whole bunch of um, uh, sphinx shapes, the oldest sphinx shapes found in Egypt, so we think that it originates around his time. So, <clears throat> let's put the sphinx onto the scene. Um, this is one of those fun things about teaching ancient history, you know, is, is there's so much weird mythology in contemporary America. You can like, I don't know, turn on ancient aliens and that kind of junk on television, or um, you can go into like the Barnes and Noble in there history section and find books about oh, the city from 10,000 years ago in Atlantis. There's books on Atlantis in the history section. Atlantis is not history. It's so much the lost continent of Mu or whatever is not history. Someone just making it up. Right? Um, sphinxes were not built by aliens. They're not super old. They're not the oldest things ever. They, they, you know, they, 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 the, the Great Sphinx we actually think was built by Jephra to honor his father. Right? So the face was probably the face of Khufu. Right? And it does, it, it antedates, the, it comes after uh, the Great Pyramid, but was built before Khafre's Pyramid, the next big one there, right? um, which actually affected the positioning when they built Khafre's Pyramid. Right? There's nothing particularly sophisticated about the construction of the Sphinx or about the pyramids. I'll give you a hint about how they're constructed in a minute here. But the Sphinx is basically just carved out of the, out of, out of the um, out of bedrock. It's carved out of the stone. They just carved this figure out of it. Um, so you can actually see the, the, the level of the ground is a little higher than it is, right? But they just like, you know, chipped out of it and made this giant statue. The, uh, the pyramids uh, are built out of large stone blocks. The blocks were carved in other locations and transported here on barges on the Nile and pulled into place by people with ropes. Pure people power. No wheels, no animals. Kind of shocking if you think about it, right? But it is possible to move these blocks even at their weight. Um, and we've kind of experimented with how, with how to do this. Um, with smaller ones, there's, there's sledges that can work with them. Um, with other ones, what they basically do is they sprinkle a bit, of, you know, they lay down some sand and they sprinkle little bits of water on it and it just slides along it. And you can actually build ramps to kind of go up the sides and again, sand and just a little bit of water and it slides along there and just through pure human power you can pull them up into place. The uh, pyramids were also not built by slaves. This is a, a fun pet peeve of mine too. It took me a while to get around. I always have to watch historical films, even the worst ones, right? Um, so I, uh, I, the, the, the bad ones I just like, I kind of play like Mystery Science three, Theater 3000 with them and just like, you know, make crack bad jokes the whole time teasing them. But I gotta watch them anyway because it's a historical film. It took me a while to get around to watching the, the film Exodus, um, Gods and Kings, uh, from a few years ago, because I started trying to watch it one day, and like, it turned me off in like the first few seconds. I put up a little, uh, a little blurb there talking about the Hebrews building pyramids. I'm like, you're, you're off by literally thousands of years. Not only were, were the pyramids not built by slaves at all, the Hebrews didn't even exist as a people when the pyramids were built. So it just, ah, what? <laughs> so, yeah. <clears throat> Um, but yeah, not slaves. They're built by off-duty by off agricultural laborers. You know, basically because it's so easy to grow food here, you've got nothing to do most of the year. So rather than just like, I don't know, just sitting around smoking weed, doing nothing, right? They're just like, hey, you want a job? Like, you know, you, you can come and work, a, work, work on my pyramid project and I'll give you like a ration of beer, right? You just, you get, you're working for like, you know, jugs of beer or something. You get, like, you get, you get paid for it. Go cool there. Throughout history, has there been any uh, certifying documents that have told us how long did the pyramids take to create? We don't know. We, we, can, we can tell a little bit um, archaeologically how long some of them took to take to make, but we don't have records of them. The Egyptians actually didn't bother to put down records for how they built them at all, um, which actually took a long time for people to sort of like work out the basic techniques for this, which is also one of the things that feeds in popular culture weird myths about how they were made even today. But just so you guys know, pyramids are an extremely low-tech creation. 
There's not a lot of science involved in this. There's not a lot of complex engineering involved in this. It's really quite, quite simple. What they did was they cleared a flat place in stone, because it's built straight on bedrock, and that's what they're using the Giza Plateau there. They flatten the area out, and what they do to, to prove that it's flat is they pipe a little water in from the Nile, and they let, lay a layer of water up there. And if it doesn't pool on one side or the other, if it's perfectly flat, perfect. The ground is flat. Take the water back out and start piling blocks. Block, 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 block. Next layer up, blocks. It's just piling up pieces. It's like, it's like a Lego set, building up a pile of Legos. Um, there's not a lot involved in there. The most complicated thing involved in them is, is some of them have an interior chamber where they have to sort of like uh, redistribute weight to have a room inside. But in pyramids that are, that are huge like this, you've got this gigantic pyramid here, it's going to have like one room smaller than this one. There's not much in there. So it's mostly just a pile of stone. It's not hollow. So it's really a very low tech uh, uh, construction. It just took a lot of time and labor to do. And certainly a lot of labor went into this. Um, the way the Egyptians actually carved a lot of their stone blocks, and this is true even for like the gigantic pillars, you know, you'll have like um, this 50 foot tall obelisk, this giant piece of solid stone there, and they carved it with other rocks. So here's, here's like this cliff side, and I'm like, I'm gonna chip this thing out to make an obelisk. I'm gonna throw a rock at it and catch the rock. Bam, bam, bam. You're just slowly pounding the rocks in to get the, the shape. It's just, just, it, it just, it makes no sense if you think about it. And can you imagine the dust? You're like inhaling all this dust. These guys are all dying of cancer, I'm sure. But, um, but it, it does work, right? And, they've, and, and we've, actually, we've actually reproduced a lot of these, technology, these techniques today to, to prove that they do work for, for construction. So it's not really a big mystery here. It's just a giant pile of blocks. Incidentally, don't climb them like this. I'm a very bad example. Just don't do this. Right, just I was going to ask if that was Yeah, you're, you're totally not supposed to do that. <laughs> you're totally not supposed to do that. Just <laughs> but, um, but I wanted to demonstrate this, the, the shape of it a little bit here. So I, just, I didn't go up very far. But. All right, so um, here are uh, the two biggest ones. Um, and the road leading up to Khafre's pyramid actually goes around the Sphinx, which is one of the ways that um, we think the Sphinx was there before. Right? And it's absolutely unique in having um, its funerary causeway come out at an angle. Um, Khafre's pyramid is also unique in that it's the only one to have its casing stones intact of the, of the pyramids of Giza. Right? Um, there are a few of the other pyramids that have various amounts of them still intact in, in different parts, some of, the much, some of the much smaller ones here, but of the larger pyramids here, this one still, you see it's got this little head on the top here where it's a bit bigger. Right? This is what's left of its casing stone. Right? So if, this would have been a little bit bigger you know, and much smoother all the way down. <coughs> uh, this is just, I, think, I thought this was hilarious. I, I, um, I travel a, a lot, uh, and uh, I, I'll come back because the digital cameras are great, and I'll come back with like 10,000 pictures, like street scenes and landscapes and all this little school stuff, you know, people I'm seeing and whatnot, and, and people are like, where are you in any of these? I'm like, I'm not, I'm, I don't have pictures taken of me. I mean, so I'd come back with like 10,000 pictures, like zero of me, and after a few years of this, I got tired of being like teased for it, so I'm like, I'll always come back with a handful of pictures, right? Um, so I'll just bring back like, you know, oh, here's, here's three or four, shut up. Right, here's pictures of me. This, this one I thought was hilarious. I had a guy take a picture of me um, doing this here, and I'm looking up, and the camel looks up at the same time, and it looks kind of like all dramatic and like, like it's deliberate, but what I was noticing was there's a pizza hut right across, this, right across in the pyramid. I was like, what? And, and it, right then he got the picture, so. so. It looks cool and dramatic, but it's really just, I'm noticing that there's a pizza hut visible to the, to, anyway. <laughs> Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit about religion and the afterlife. Uh, we don't have time to talk uh, in great deal, uh, detail about a lot of myths in this class. Um, there are places where we're all trying to slip them in. If we've got little bits of time here and there, if they, if they make some sense, we can do. But for the most part, I can't walk you through this god and that god and the other god. But there are a few places where it really makes sense to, to bring little bits of it in here. Um, the afterlife is going to slowly develop as an idea in uh, ancient Egypt out of a handful of traditions here and largely because this is a really good place to live. And it's easy to think that the gods wanted you to be happy, that they blessed you, that they, that they love you so much, that look, they gave us, oh my god, the Nile Valley is so awesome, of course they love us. Right? So it makes a certain amount of sense. But it actually evolved slowly 
in the earliest period here, it was really only for the upper classes, so really only for the rulers. The rulers were living gods, of course, and they stayed gods after they died, and they continued to stay alive. People would say prayers. Each of the pyramids, each of these um, tombs for an emperor or ruler, a pharaoh, would have a temple next to it. And priests would continue to work at that temple for centuries afterwards. And as long as they kept saying the prayers and rituals, the ba of the emperor, the, the, the ka, the soul of the emperor, would still be around. It would continue to live and thrive and function as, as a god. You cool there? So there's a, you know, it, it depends upon you know, the, the believers in a sense here, but it keeps alive that living god as a god. Uh, and that will slowly shift outward from there into an idea that applies to basically anybody who can afford the right rituals for burial. If you can afford to be buried with, um, uh, you know, the, the, initially the pyramid text, the earliest text here discussing the afterlife, um, were later turned into a, a written form that could be put in a papyrus, what's called the Book of the Dead. If you could afford a copy of the Book of the Dead to be buried with and be, you know, to be mummified, then even if you're put like after the mummification, you put in, like a little wooden box and you just stuff the book in there, you've got an afterlife. You, like, you, you, they, you do the right rituals, done, you've got an afterlife. So still, the poorest of the poor are not going to get this, but the techniques got so widespread that even very poor people frequently could afford to do this. Right? So it does slowly democratize. But initially, it's very much restricted to the ruling classes. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, actually, let's see, where Actually, this is the best place. I think I can do this just a minute. I want to I give you... Um, just a moment about like you know why how this how this basically happens you know where the uh, the afterlife kind of comes from because it's actually very it, there's a, there's a very long version of the story here but I can, you can get to like just the core essence of it um, Egyptian gods all came in pairs male and female pairs and those pairs were always both siblings and uh, spouses right and they're, they're all kind of like archetypal pairs, and each of the pairs has like certain things that they're kind of like in charge of, and they kind of go together, right? So there's a kind of like certain symmetry to the, the, to the way their religion works. Um, the, the god Osiris' brother Set was kind of a dick and really wanted to kill him, right? And he tries several times, and you know, each time his uh, uh, wife manages to save him somehow, or something happens, and he's, he's okay, right? But the, uh, the last time, uh, Set manages to kill Osiris. He chops him up into little pieces and scatters the pieces all over the place. They, there's no way you're bringing him back now. He's like chopped up. He's like, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre on him. Like, just chopped him up into little pieces. Um, but um, his wife, Ist, um, we usually call her um, Isis or Isis from, uh, from the Greek form of her name. Um, but his wife, Ist, went and found all the pieces and sewed him back together, kind of a Frankenstein's monster style. Right? So Osiris is actually the first zombie in history. Um, Osiris is always depicted in green um, in Egyptian art. Um, it, it, gets a, it lets you know he's dead, because <laughs> he was dead and then resurrected. Um, but there's a, any kind of like piece you can add on to that too. Um, well, first off, he's the god, he becomes the god of the dead in the underworld at this point because he's resurrected. And the process they go through and the rituals that Ist uses, the magic that she uses to resurrect him, is the basis for the Book of the Dead that's used to give everyone else uh, an afterlife. Do you see how, how that works? She brought him back from the dead, and that shows the way to, that they can bring you back from the dead, too, that uh, you, too, can kind of like pass on beyond this life. And um, mummies always have to be complete. If you lost your leg in life, right, and had like a peg leg or something or a crutch or something, when they, they died, they would make a leg for you. Right, they would just you know you know get like ivory or whatever some kind of like material and they would make an artificial leg and kind of like dress it up with it and wrap, wrap it up in it so you'd be complete. Um, Osiris was almost complete when she put him back together, but he was she was she couldn't find his um, you know <laughs> his unit. His uh, set had thrown it into the Nile and it was devoured by three fish. Right, they just gobbled this thing up. Um, so she made an artificial one for him when she brought him back to life. Um, and of course, they have a son afterwards, so it's like a, there's a, a virgin birth for Horus, too, which is kind of cool. But um, anyway, uh, that's, that's how we get to the idea of resurrection. The resurrection of Os allowed all Egyptians access to the afterlife. Cool, right? <clears throat> so the first intermediate period is a period of collapse. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, 
What happens here is it's the first sustained droughts. Things don't run particularly well. The, the Nile is running too low, uh, so it doesn't inundate as much. The crops don't grow as well. There's, there's widespread hunger, so it causes a political collapse, and they have to kind of rebuild from this. And what this will do is it teaches one important lesson. The pyramids are built in the Old Kingdom period. Temple, temples and tombs were built for all later rulers, but they tended to be much, much smaller. Why? Because there's a lot more skepticism toward the rulers. In the earlier periods here, in the Old Kingdom here, uh, the, the Pharaoh could say, the Nile is awesome because of me. It's me. It's me. It's I make, I make it happen. You know, I make it, I'm the living God. I'm the reason everything is super awesome. And then, of course, when things started going wrong for a few years, well, what's wrong with the king? Clearly, the king is not able to take care of us. There's a little bit of skepticism. I mean, clearly, he's not all powerful. You see how that works? So in what becomes the Middle Kingdom period, the period that follows that, when they reconstitute the state, um, they introduce a few elements to, to, to temper the power of the pharaoh. For the first time, the pharaoh has a bureaucratic state. He has to rule with other people. He has advisors that are kind of appointed there, and high priests that have to work with him, and you know, they all have a certain amount of authority as well. Right? And from this point, um, uh, there'll be a, a little bit more decentralization in government. There'll be individual governors in different provinces here that have a significant amount of political power as well. So the pharaoh isn't responsible for everything anymore. The other thing I want to throw at you for the, uh, the Middle Kingdom period is we're going to talk about the language. The writing system for Egypt develops over a very long period of time. Right? The first elements, actually, of it we can see all the way back in the Archaic period before the, before the Old Kingdom. Uh, but it takes on its fullest form you know, in, in widespread use in the Middle Kingdom period here because there's a, a much heavier emphasis on writing because suddenly you have um, a priest class keeping formal records. You have a bureaucracy keeping government records. Before, our earliest examples of writing are things like just a few religious texts carved into stone here and there. There's not as much material that survives. We have a ton of material that survives from the Middle Kingdom period on because writing shows up everywhere. Right? It takes on all kinds of political uses as well. The writing system um, is uh, we call um, uh, hieroglyphs. Um, hieroglyphic is actually the, the uh, adjective form, so you can't call them hieroglyphics. That doesn't actually make sense, just so you know. They're hieroglyphs. Um, and it just basically, it's from a Greek word meaning sacred writing. Uh, and I guess we originally thought that this was just like some purely religious type thing when they initially discovered these texts and come to find out, no, it actually is a full writing system. The writing system is actually quite weird. Um, it uh, starts off all pictographically, like it's you know drawings of things, right? Um, and it evolves from there like the cuneiform system, but what it does is it evolves in a different direction. What it does is it continues to have a whole bunch of symbols that stand for certain ideas. So there's a lot of symbols you've got to learn to be literate. But a lot of the symbols actually took on an alphabetic quality, a certain sound. Right? So, um, uh, so this is a sound, and this feather here, that's a sound. Right, they're, they're basically standing for letters. So you can kind of read Egyptian out phonetically up until you get to a point where like, okay, that's, that's a different symbol, and you gotta know that symbol, and then you read phonetically, and then there's a symbol. You see how, how that goes? It's also weird in that you can write Egyptian in any direction. You can write it um, you know, up, down, top, down, left to right, right to left, which is weird. It, they, you know, and they did that for artistic reasons. You could actually have it kind of coming up both sides of a door and meeting in the middle. Right into the same text and around there. Um, so it's very challenging to read. You have to really know the system well to make sense of the text. Right? The most common way it's written is top to bottom. Right? It just it reads down right? in, in little columns there. But it can be written in other directions as well. Now, we are probably well familiar from it from papyri, from writings on papyrus. Um, you may have heard of papyrus before. Did you want to? Yeah. Uh, yeah. If they can write it in any direction, then how would you be able to tell where it started? Um, if you know the symbols well enough, and you, know, and you also know the language, so you recognize the words, um, then it does make sense. Uh, have you ever seen um, those posters or memes where like, they, they, take, um, uh, they take words and jumble them up, but you can still read it? Right? Um, because you, you kind of, in context, you can recognize the basic shapes. Or if you took a sentence and you removed all the vowels, and you just had the words, by context, you could actually probably figure out that text pretty well and still read it. It would look weird, but you could tell. If you know the language well, 
Um, it, uh, you, it, it is kind of ob obvious to do it. But it does make it challenging to learn if you don't grow up with it. Um, papyrus is not paper. Um, it's not created in any way like paper. It's basically uh, a Nile reed. Um, uh, it grows only really well in the Nile Valley. It needs the constant sunlight, so technically you can grow it in Southern California, but I can tell you from experience it's a stupid idea. Don't do it, because it takes an absurd amount of water. Um, but the, what it does is you take these reeds and you lay them down in rows, and you lay another row down, so you make a little cross hatch, a little pattern there, and you stamp all the water, moisture out of it. You, you, you know, bang, all, bang it to totally dry, right? Let the stuff dry out, and then it sticks together. Right? These rows will stick together. Right? And then you can just write on it. Right? One of the neat things about papyrus is actually you can wet it again, take them back apart, and we have a number of documents now that we can scan through with uh, you know, uh, penetrating x-rays and whatnot and see that people have like taken a, a document apart, flipped the, t the, pa the, the, the reeds around, put it back together, and reused it. Which is kind of neat. <laughs> so, like, you know, two books for the price of one you can get. Um, but So it's, it's, it's durable, it's reusable, and because the climate is very dry, it's well preserved. Um, tons of this stuff gets buried and it survives. People still find these on a regular basis. You, you know, people dig up bits of papyri that have managed to survive for thousands of years buried in the sand there. Um, and you know, it gives us a much larger um, collection of documents to work from. Now, the writing that you saw in stone, the hieroglyphs that you can see carved into the stone there, would be an extremely cumbersome system to write on uh, papyrus or paper. Right? Um, and the simple fact is, people didn't do that. It, it, didn't, it didn't happen. Right? In the New Middle Kingdom period, when we develop papyri and the large-scale records, the priests developed a cursive form. The older writing system was used for temple walls in stone, and since that was the only use, it's fine. You can carve that in stone, no big deal. Right? But to write that out, very difficult. So they developed a cursive form of that. That's this. This is the hieratic script. So we've got examples of this throughout the Middle Kingdom period. The hieratic script eventually evolves into the demotic script, and the demotic script becomes Coptic, which is, is still the religious language of the Christian minority uh, in Egypt. Right? So um, it you know, has a very long history as you know, a, a language. Right? The, um, uh, the, uh, the writing system, though, when it's done in stone, when you see them on temple walls and whatnot, they always still use the hieroglyphs. These, these scripts here, only exist in records. Never in a religious text, right? So not like a, a Book of the Dead or something, and never, ever put on a temple wall, right? They continue for thousands of years to write exactly the same way as they did in the Old Kingdom on the walls. Um, and that again speaks to the cultural conservatism of Egypt. You can see that also in art. Egyptian art changed very little. By the time they'd gotten to the Middle Kingdom period, it had become so formalized that they developed a kind of like uh, paint by number system. They would, uh, on a new temple wall, they would put a grid on the wall. So kind of like imagine you're know, drawing like little boxes with pencils. And then everyone would just know that, okay, the nose starts to come out here at, you know, in this square, you know, goes up halfway. And you'd basically just learn to, to draw that way so that everyone can reproduce art exactly the same way. So there's that. Um, one of the main reasons to point to the writing system here is just again to give you a sense of how much more we know about Egypt than a lot of other ancient civilizations because there's so much material that survives. You could literally, you can literally brew Egyptian beer because we have their recipes. There are Egyptian cookbooks. Right? Um, you know, the, you know, we have like tons of material that survived there telling us a great deal about things. Now there's many things they didn't bother to write about. Um, we do have a lot of medical texts, for example. Um, uh, so we have uh, a tremendous amount of detail in terms of like how they dealt with things, how they sewn up wounds, that sort of thing, how they cured a headache, but they never bothered to write down how they mummified a body. There are no texts that cover that. It had, be, it had to be reverse engineered. They had to figure this thing, a lot of this out from the material evidence. Right? Um, so there are some things they wrote a lot about and other things that they chose for various reasons never to write about. Right? But there is a tremendous amount of material that survives here. And you can see developing in this period um, that religious conception I'd pointed to here, where it's sort of expanding to more and more people, that the afterlife is more available, the sense that your, your cock can survive, that there's a kind of immortality of the soul available to Egyptians. So it brings us to an important religious point that I want to make. 
We're going to deal with in this class a number of important religious concepts that we can see um, relating to one another. We can see connecting to, influencing, passing from one to the other. That there's a, a kind of like continuity we can see. All right? I'm going to sketch out a few basic points like that. Um, and this is the first step toward that. The first significant concept that we're going to see carried forward and used in, in, in other civilizations. The Egyptian religion is the first one we can truly talk of as an ethical religion. An ethical religion is, I mean this in a very specific sense. Uh, I don't mean just they're moral, they're good people. You know, that, that's a very loose use of the word ethics. Um, ethical means to follow certain rules, right? to follow a certain system. Uh, an ethical religion is one in which you follow the rules and there's a reward or punishment based upon whether or not you follow them. Does that sound familiar to you guys as an idea? Okay. Same familiar? The Mesopotamians didn't have that. The gods really didn't care if you were a total dick, right? If you were an awful human being, beating your neighbors up, killing somebody there, there was no special punishment awaiting you in an afterlife. The gods didn't care. It wasn't relevant to them. There was no sense of divine justice that followed you into the afterlife, right? There is for the Egyptians. So it's the first time we, this kind of a concept appears in history. Now, it's not um, the way that we might recognize some of these things, there's no true concept of like a hell, for example, right? Um, there's no places of torment if you didn't follow all the rules here. So it's not quite like, the, say, the Christian sense or the Muslim sense, but it's a major step toward that. Right? And I'll, uh, I'll kind of describe that by giving you a small piece, a tiny fragment here out of um, the Book of the Dead. <clears throat> we can, you know, describe a little bit about um, a judgment scene. There is, at the end of your life, a judgment and they will determine whether or not you followed all the rules you know were you a good person here we can see a set of scales and they're weighing your heart against a feather and if your heart is heavier than the feather you were a bad person so they're going to take that heart you see this uh, this ugly looking god over here with the crocodile head they'll just toss it to him and he'll swallow it and bye bye you poof gone Right? So there's your punishment, no afterlife for you. Right? So it basically deprives you of, of, of the underworld. Right? But if um, your heart was lighter than the feather, you get to walk up, pass through, um, pass, pa go, go past Osiris and enter into the underworld. Right? Or you can kind of like live on forever. Right? And, and in that sense, it gets a lot closer to the sort of like heaven sort of idea. Right? Um, again, a lot of differences, but it's much closer to it. If it's tied, which you can see at this point here, um, the next panel after this would have like the, the guys along the top, there's a row of 14 people on the top there that get, get to vote and they'll like hold up an onk to, you know, if they're voting for you to be a good person, silly. You get to, why they picked an even number for, for a tiebreaker makes no sense, but whatever. <laughs> um, I'm sure they thought 14 was a particularly groovy number. Okay. But um, this is uh, basically the, the first attempt at a, a kind of a judgment system. And that sense of divine judgment with, uh, based upon whether or not you followed certain rules in life is an idea that we are going to see repeated in a lot of religions after this. Cool. Um, I'm going to leave the, um, the rest of the, uh, the Middle Kingdom period here and look at its, its end. Right? The Middle Kingdom period comes apart differently from the Old Kingdom. The Old Kingdom came apart from a natural disaster. The, the Nile ran low for, for a few years. It kind of messed, it messed up agriculture, caused starvation. Right. Totally uh, um, a, a unpredictable natural disaster here. Uh, what happens to create the second intermediate period is an invasion from the outside. Right? It's a foreign conquest. And that's the invasion of, uh, of, of the Hyksos. Right? These people kind of like carve, come in here and they, they ride in on their chariots and whatnot and they conquer large parts of Egypt. And this is the first time Egypt had ever been conquered. Right? So this is the first time that they really have faced an outside threat. And this causes a massive realignment. So what we're going to deal with here in our last 10 minutes or so is talking about the New Kingdom period, you know, some of the significant changes. And to talk about the New Kingdom, I'm primarily going to do it by making uh, uh, some quick references to like three different rulers. I'm going to use them as examples of like different characteristics of this period overall. But the first key feature to hold in mind, the thing you want to remember most about the New Kingdom period as a whole is that this is the only time in all of Egypt's history when it is a conquering empire. 
because the Egyptians decided, after the Hyksos were defeated and chased out, that the best defense is a good offense. Right? That from now on, they're going to attack their neighbors, they're going to extract tribute from them, they're going to show them who's boss, they're going to extend their power. They never colonize, they don't annex the territory, but they subjugate territories and make them into vassals of Egypt. So they actually build an empire. Cool there? So that's the, the only time that you've really got that sort of uh, ideal. Okay, so here's a fun one to start with. Um, there is something different about this pharaoh. Can you, can you tell what it is? Impressed. Yeah! yeah it's, 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 figured someone's eyes would go right to that. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, Hatshepsut is female. Right? Um, and this, is, this, is, this actually is her. She looks pretty good for her age, I think. Thanks. Um, given, you know, that she's quite old. Look, look, it's just 35. I, I hope I look that good at 3,500. Um, but uh, Hatshepsut um, was initially um, a regent for uh, her young son. Her, you know, her, her husband had died. Um, and women throughout history have frequently been able to serve as regents. They rule in the name of um, a minor son until he comes of age. Um, and she's initially ruling as a regent. But she then declares herself Pharaoh in her own right, just as her son would have reached the age of maturity and could have taken over as Pharaoh. So she basically usurped power from him and set him aside, and she ruled as Pharaoh under her own name for 20 years. So she got away with it, right? Uh, clearly she had to have had the support of the priesthood and bureaucracy to pull this off. Clearly she had to have the support of the military, nobody overthrew her. And actually, it's tempting to think that her son was kind of pissed by this, that he might have been resentful, but realistically, we have no evidence at all that he objected to this. Right? Uh, all indications are that he went along with it, that he was fine with this. Right? And he does, you know, you know, like he, he does succeed her as the next. Right? Uh, so she does succeed in claiming power for herself. Now, after her death, the priesthood goes out of its way to remove all records of this. And when Egyptians kept king lists, there are a number of kings that are missing from that king list. Uh, she's one of them frequently. They, they decided to try and expunge her from history, right? It, it took a while to kind of like reconstruct a lot of these stories. Um, uh, and you can see a, an example of this. On the wall here, um, you can see um, the carbon bas relief. So you can see the, 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 the relief standing out, the carving here, and it would have been originally brightly painted. You see what happened here? Carved out in stone. Yeah, she was chipped out, yeah. This, this was Hatshepsut, right? And someone basically took a hammer and chisel and went chip, 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 and took her off. And then went, went read, read on the text there and found her name, wherever her, her cartouche, wherever her name shows up, chip, 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 chopped it out, right? Trying symbolically to remove her from history. But they couldn't do it completely, right? Um, it, it, was, it wasn't possible entirely. Um, this actually is her temple, her funerary temple, which was protected after her death and did survive. Um, and it's actually a major source of information for us uh, today about her. Um, so clearly they could not pull this off. She, she maintained a very devoted following long after her death. Right? Um, but the people who worked for other later pharaohs were somewhat resentful and did try to remove you know, any kind of like traces of this. So, um, and the reason to bring this up is I want to make a quick, few quick comments on, um, on women in Egypt. All right? uh, so for women in Egypt, what we want to understand here is uh, something about their relation, their, the relations between the sexes in society. What we can see over and over again in civilization after civilization, um, the more economic power women have, the more social status they have. Does that make sense as a basic idea? Um, so if you, for example, um, do not allow women to get jobs and go to work, what would happen? They'd have no financial power. Yeah, they don't know. They don't have, have no independent financial power. So what would that do to them? Cripple them to fall underneath the mountain. Yeah, it would make them dependent upon some dude, right? They they, they might be stuck in, a, in, a, in an unhappy marriage because they depend upon him to you know eat. You know, uh, so divorce rates would be much less common, right? They would be stuck, right? But you give women their own independent economic standing, and guess what, guys? They don't have to put up your crap anymore. They can leave. Right? That's kind of how that works. Right? Um, the more economic status you give women, the more social status they gain. 
And you can see an example of this. And you'll see examples of this throughout this class whenever we talk about relations between the sexes and difference in civilizations. Some places women will have less status than in others, right? Where they fall exactly will vary a lot. Uh, male dominance is, is, is true everywhere, but it's always in varying degrees. Cool there? We have an example here you can contrast with when we get to the Greeks in a few weeks or a couple weeks or whatever. Um, in ancient Greece, no, no man would talk to his wife you know, or admit that he does so at least. Right? It just wasn't cool. Right? Guys had guy friends, women had women friends, and you just didn't mix. Right? The exact opposite understanding uh, applies here. And you can really see that because we have a bunch of records of um, men who were too sick to go to work in their government job for a while, so their wives filled in or men who were sent off on a diplomatic mission, they left the country for a while, so they're gone for a few months, so the wife fills in. That only works if you expect, if it's an understanding that husbands and wives talk, that they share ideas, right? Because she's gotta know like what his plans are, how his job works, you know, who the good guys are, and you know, who, the, who the slackers are, and how, because you know, he's gotta come home and talk about it, right? So it tells us a lot more about their relationship, doesn't it? Right? So there's a lot of things we can, we, can, we can infer from those. You can also see that women did have inheritance rights, so they had their own money, and in the marriages, they were guaranteed control over one-third of the finances of the, of, of the marriage. So they always had access to the, their own cash. Right? They could engage in business themselves, and they had money if they wanted to leave. So if the marriage didn't work out, you could divorce in ancient Egypt, and women could move on. Right? Uh, so a uh, very different sort of situation than you'll see in a lot of other places. Here is just a, a quick map showing you the, the greatest extent of New Kingdom Egypt's control. If you remember, e ancient Egypt is just this, right? So we're, uh, here's our, our, our border lines here. Um, our ancient capitals here of like Memphis and Thebes, right? This long stretch here, this is ancient Egypt. But here you can see they're expanding along the coast westward. They're expanding to the south and they're defeating the Nubians and taking this territory here. They're taking the Sinai and they've taken the Levant. Right. We'll run into some of the uh, implications of that on the, uh, on the day we talk about the Hebrews, right? because uh, for a good period of time, uh, uh, this, that area where like, ancient Israel is was actually under Egyptian control, and that has some, you know, some significant uh, complications. So um, the other guy I want to give you here um, a little bit about is um, a fellow who originally is, uh, takes power as Aminhotep IV but he changes his name partway into his reign. And he becomes the figure Akhenaten, right? uh, one who honors Aten. Right? Uh, the, uh, the names always you know, have, have, have some kind of like a broader religious significance. Um, take a look at his, his, uh, his statue here. Um, the Amarna period in, in Egyptian art is absolutely unique because Egyptians, remember, do not prize innovation. They're not a creative people. They value permanence and stability and doing things the same way. They did paint by numbers on temple walls, for crying out loud. So statues always looked the same. They didn't really change the way they did things. Um, Akhenaten actually told people to experiment, to, to do weird things, to kind of like, you know, be much more expressive. The art in this period is absolutely bizarre uh, for Egyptian, by Egyptian standards. And you can see that in the way that um, he's depicted too. Um, you can see one zoomed in uh, here on your face. Um, take a look at the, the facial features. Look at the jawline here. Is this a particularly masculine jawline? No. Not at all, right? Uh, it's in fact a distinctly feminine jawline. And he was frequently depicted with wide hips too, right? Which is an odd thing for a ruler to do, especially since Egyptian rulers by this point were also expected to be military commanders. New Kingdom rulers had to be generals as well because again, this is a conquering empire for the first time, right? Uh, so it's an unusual sort of approach. What Akhenaten does is he founds a new religion. I had you guys read a little bit about this, so I'm going to put it on a picture here and ask just a quick question. What stands out the most about this religion? What did you guys see in that second source? Anybody saw this one? You guys see this? Anybody saw the second source? Cool. What's, what stands out the most about this to you? Family. Like uh, his. The, 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 the document. The, the, the hymn to Aten that you guys had to read through. It was like a prayer. It's a prayer. It's, it's, it's like, a, like a song, like a hymn. It's a long prayer to a god. It's like praising a god. Like you would sing it during like, baptism or something. Yeah, so like, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's, it's a prayer intended to be kind of chanted out. 
Do you have a, what about this God stands out to you? It was like very focused on the sun and light. Uh, yeah. Keeping like bees at bay at night and bringing like fertile, you know, crops and whatnot. Oh yeah, sun and light. So like the, the sun is like, you know, the, the, the symbol of Aten and the sun brings warmth in the day and, you know, protects us all here, makes the crops grow, gives us the light that protects us from the, from the wild beasts at night. Right? So when the sun goes down, we pray that he comes back the next day, right, and protects us again. The night is a time of terror. The night is dark and full of terrors. Right? Um, so you're kind of, you know, waiting for Aten to come back and, and bring you protection there. So you're giving him a lot of power there already. Anything else stand out about this guy? There's only one God here. Atenism is a monotheistic religion. And there's a number of references in the hymn here that actually make this kind of clear. Um, uh, uh, o Aten, uh, beside whom there is, there are, there is none. Right? Um, and he's given like uh, fertility roles, for example. He causes the babies to grow in the wombs, which is you know, a, 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 usually a very distinct thing from say like the sun or war or anything else here. Basically all of the, the features that you would give uh, to different gods are rolled into this one god. Right? This is the first state-sponsored monotheistic cult in, in, in world history. Right? The first time there was an official religion centered on one god that denied the existence of other gods. Right? Uh, and it takes a long time before anybody else catches up to this sort of idea. There are a few religions shortly thereafter this that start to say you don't worship other gods, but not other ones that said that the other gods don't exist. That takes a long time to develop. Right? So it's an unusual period, but it doesn't last. Right? Here's a, just a, a quick uh, piece again of, of art and how this is sort of unusual in the period. Right? This is not generally how you depict things. First off, um, this is uh, Akhenaten here and his, uh, his, his wife Nefertiti there. Generally, in Egyptian art, they represented things symbolically. So if the pharaoh is drawn this tall, his wife is drawn this tall. Right? And that doesn't mean all the pharaohs married midgets. Right? It means that she has less status than him. We're supposed to see this stands out. This is the pharaoh. Right? It's very symbolic. The fact that they're, they're drawn here using actually realistic you know, sexual dimorphism, the slight difference in height between men and women, right? It's very realistic in that sense, isn't it? A little pot belly. Yeah, he has a little pot belly there too, right? Which also, you know, we kind of like usually downplay that sort of thing to like, you know, the, the warrior, right? They're, they're kind of like, you know, showing all of his imperfections. Um, what is Akhenaten doing? Kissing his kid. Yeah, he's kissing a baby, right? Um, here he is like kissing his daughter, right? This is just a cute little family scene. That kind of domestic art is just not normal for a pharaoh, right? Uh, pharaohs are depicted like riding chariots and like crushing their enemies with maces or something, like, you know, all these kind of heroic poses. This is just not the way you would normally want to be depicted, right? So it's interesting here. And you can see, of course, the rays of the Aten blessing them, kind of coming down in the center here. But what Akhenaten did was he abandoned all of his other responsibilities. He built a whole new capital Oddly enough, he built it on the wrong bank of the Nile, too, where people never built cities before, um, and built a whole new capital there, and then retreated to that and stopped paying attention to anything else that was going on. So when things started going wrong, you know, there's like corruption, governors are messing things up here and whatnot, be like, oh, yeah, you know, Mr. Pharaoh, we got, a, we got a problem here, and you'd be like, dude, leave me alone, I'm petting my cat, I'm too busy, right? So, yeah, it did not work out terribly well. But it does actually survive, he does actually manage to pass power to an heir. Um, we, we don't think that he died, you know, he was killed, but he might have been, you know, but either way, he does rather abruptly disappear from history. And after his death, shortly after his death, the capital was abandoned and they went back to the old ways and reopened all the old temples. Now, I don't normally take any time to talk about this guy here, but I throw him into the story for two basic reasons. One, because you may have heard of him, because his was the only tomb found intact um, or almost completely intact from the ancient world. It was not robbed in antiquity. So we learned rather a lot from it. Um, but the other reason to put him here is that he was actually born Tutankaten as a son of Akhenaten. Um, but he changed his name back uh, to honor Amun-Ra. So he restored all the old cults here. Imagine all the enemies that uh, Akhenaten must have made amongst the traditional priesthood and the traditional ruling class. 
right? So maybe you know they you know restored power in some way or another here. They and they manipulated the boy king here to restore things. Now he's he dies very very young. He's a completely insignificant ruler. Well, the only thing important about him is we found his tomb. Right? Um, but he does actually restore um, the old religion here. The last guy I can kind of like close the period on here is the last really. Um, the last really powerful ruler of the New Kingdom period in some ways, um, because there are a number of ways in which Egypt will go into economic decline after this period. Um, but Ramesses II is in some ways a kind of a high point. Now, he is a, a great propagandist. He is not actually a great general, but he really talks himself up. You know, he's like, he, he, was, he was like all that in a bag of chips as far as he was concerned, but he really wasn't all that great uh, in many ways. But he did preside over a period of prosperity, and he did manage to leave behind more statues of himself than any other ruler in Egyptian history, which does tell us something about the prosperity of the time, that he could get away with that. Right. Um, that, 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 incidentally, that, that's him too. He also looks pretty good for his age, I think. Right. Um, so um, this uh, is another, one of the reasons I sometimes, when there's time, like we'll mention a few things about the Hittites. He did fight a war with the Hittites and fought to a draw and we have the first actual peace treaty in world history. All right? um, this is uh, not kind of some kind of like surrender or subjugation here. This is basically like, let's draw a line to separate our territories here, and we'll both claim that we won. And like, cool, that sounds good. And they both went home and claimed that they won. All right? um, which is an interesting sort of idea. All right? this, this comes at, at, in many ways out of the Hittite approach to law and whatnot. We don't need to get into that, but um, it makes a certain amount of sense. Um, this is just a, a fun one here. I can kind of like start closing on a, on a, on a sort of a, a fun story, a little anecdote here. There's, um, there were a pair of temples made um, in the far south of Egypt, technically across the border from what they considered Egypt to be and in the, into Nubia, right? So they built them deliberately there just so that the Nubians would be like, you have to face, you know, the Egyptians and acknowledge their superiority or whatever. Um, but it was a temple to Ramesses and one to his wife. Right? And these were originally carved into a cliff face. Right? Um, but the, uh, when Egypt decided to build a dam there uh, in the late 1950s, it was going to create a large reservoir lake, and this whole area would have been underwater. So um, rather than losing a lot of important antiquities, uh, an army of nerds descended upon Egypt from all around the world, and they cut into that cliff face and removed the entire thing perfectly, stone by stone, cut up in little pieces, carried it up to higher ground and reassembled it. The temple itself looks exactly the way it looked. It's actually very difficult to find even the seams in some places. You can still find them here and there in like little numbers scribbled on in places here, but they did a really good job of reassembling this thing. And they even put it back places that were broken. Like so one of these statues was broken off and they just put the stones back the way they were. Right. Um, so it's a really interesting sort of project in that. But um, one of the reasons I like pointing to it as well, though, um, you see the, the four seated people in the front of it? They're all him. It was like four Ramesses the seconds all in a row. <laughs> this guy really wanted to be noticed. <laughs> right. um, just in case one big statue of me isn't enough to impress the Nubians, put four of them there. <laughs> right? That was how he wanted to be remembered. Okay, so. Um, I put on the end here um, a, a little bit about um, some of the, the later dynasties in Egypt. We don't need to, to, to go into them there. I want to make two quick cultural comments and we'll get out of here. One is slavery only shows up in Egypt in the New Kingdom period. It really wasn't a thing before this point. So again, slaves did not build the pyramids. Slavery was very uncommon beforehand here and it was still not very common even here. But it, it did happen in the New Kingdom period because they conquered other peoples. The other thing to point to here is the end. You know, what sort of like takes this period down? Why is the New Kingdom the last significant period in Egyptian history? They never even got to the Iron Age. They just didn't bother. And part of that is that cultural conservatism. They stayed with Bronze Age technology, which means that one of the peoples we're going to talk about um, uh, you know, next time, we're going to talk about China, and then we're going to talk about the Assyrians after the break. The Assyrians are an Iron Age people who will conquer the Egyptians. Right? So that's why that's kind of like the end of the road for them. Cool there? Perfect, it's 9.10. I'm going to shut up now. I'm contractually obligated to shut up and let you guys go, so. Sayonara, <coughs> adios, good night. Next time in China. <laughs> <laughs>